loving Lord, our, our Father and our great God, we want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given us, each and every one of being at this school of the prophets, O oh Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the revelation of your love for each and every one of us. And as we've come to the last day of this school, O oh Lord, we ask and pray that you help us to be willing, to be made willing to go into the valley, into the streets and in the highways and to share this wonderful revelation of your love with those who are in darkness, with those who do not know you, O oh Lord. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for granting us a new day, a new opportunity of coming together in this fashion. And we ask and pray that you'll bless us once again with your presence. We pray in a special way, O oh Lord, that you'll be with your manservant, Jeff, and that you'll place a coal from the altar upon his lips, O oh Lord, and that each and every one of us will receive another revelation of your love for us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning. Uh, I would like to recommend to you this study that we're doing in its uh, fullest sense, which we have on tape, um, called The Prophetic Pattern. If you happen to get it, by the way, and you get, you, it's one of them that I recommend you get the notes with because of the visuals help. And uh, years ago, when we first did this uh, presentation, Brother Glenn typed up the notebook for it, and uh, he put the wrong title on the notebook. He put prophetic timelines. So if you get the, the series and you get the notebook, the series is prophetic pattern, the notebook is prophetic timelines, but they're the same series, and we still haven't run out of those hundreds of notebooks that we printed way back when. But that, I want that for the record, because we're only taking two strokes at this. And uh, I thought you would say that. And uh, the, it's caused a little bit of confusion for about eight or nine years now. but. Um, I know I've never w went through this to the depth that you can go through it. And I had a brother come up here right at the beginning, and he says, what I want you to do is take this pattern here and take the pattern from Gideon and, and overlay it and take the pattern from here and overlay it and take in which you should do because the light just expands and all I usually do is try to establish the pattern and uh, then, of course, the, the, for me, the most serious part of the pattern is when we take the first, second, and third angel's message that came into history in the Millerite time period and then acknowledge that the Millerite time period is going to be repeated again to the very letter which teaches that we will have three tests because Sister White tells us that the first, second, third angel's messages were tests and then we look at how those tests are illustrated at the end of the world. At the end of the, uh, this prophecy school, I need to apologize, but one of the things that bothers me that I forgot to do is Brother Wolfgang came up, I think yesterday or the day before, and he says, what we need to do is we need to get everyone together for a group picture. And I said, yes. And then that, as soon as I said yes, the whole thought left my mind, and now half of us are gone, but we should have brought everybody up here at some point and got a picture of the class. Um, so apologies for that. I would like to uh, say thanks for, um, there's a brother here that's helped, uh, you've all helped financially. I know that you all had to pay to be here anyway, but there's one brother especially that uh, spent a lot of money to make things happen here. The, the cost of the um, video production um, was the highest expense, and he more than exceeded that. And... Uh, I want to thank some of the people that came early and um, brought all the hymnals that we've been using so we could be using Adventist hymnals. We didn't have these, and I thought that was a blessing. And they also brought a lot of good food from California. And, and there's always a danger if, uh, if I start thanking everyone that I'll miss someone and uh, uh, you know hurt someone's feeling. But 
thank you f for everyone that's participated. I want to thank Glenn. I don't know if you've been around video productions before, but he's been working harder than anyone here on a regular basis, and particularly on the Sabbath day, he was doing the same thing, which is keeping focused. So um, thanks for his extra effort. And uh, I can't believe that it all came together with, you. if you remember, virtually all of them, we contacted you before the meeting and asked you if you could do special music, and there was only a handful of us that were willing to do special music, and I wasn't willing either, so I understand that, that conviction, but uh, the Lord brought Brother Johannes, with, which, I mean, he just kept uh, the musical part right up there at the, a higher level than I possibly thought we would pull off. Um, it's been a blessing, and then everyone that walked up and did their special music's been a blessing as well. And uh, I, there's some faces gone, so I may be forgetting um, a few other things that I thought about saying here last night as I was laying in my bed. The dynamics have been wonderful as far as I was concerned. I've learned a lot of things. I learned, uh, and I learned this here, that... Uh, the Millerite time period in 1840 was a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. And that manifestation of the power of God developed two classes within the church. And of course, we deal a great deal with the parable of the ten virgins, but Sister White is clear that this Laodicean condition wasn't simply in the church, it was in the world, it was in the world at large as well. And in the 1840 time period, there was two classes being developed. And the focal point of this uh, light, this wonderful manifestation of the powerful God, the focal point of it, the beginning part, was the United States. And uh, this manifestation of the power of God uh, developed two groups in the United States, and then we're told that this message was carried to every mission station in the world. So there was a specific geographical sequence uh, that is symbolized in the pioneer time period. First the United States then the world, and uh, they reached a point in 1843, brothers and sisters, if you're familiar with Bible prophecy and Adventism, you'll find that the 1335 of Daniel 12 is one of the most attacked uh, pioneer truths that there is. Brings you to 1843, and Daniel 12 says there's a blessing to come to 1843. That has to mean something for us. For me, for a long time, it's meant that when you get to 1843, you've reached a blessed time period between 1843 and the third angel's message on October 22nd, 1844, because when the third angel's message arrives in history in Revelation 14, as soon as it's stated, what does it, ta what does it say? It says, blessed are the dead who, who, that die in the Lord henceforth, for their works do follow them, maybe a bad paraphrase. But from 1843 until the third angel's message, we see a time period that begins with a blessing, ends with a blessing. This was a sacred time when the Lord was binding up the wise virgins for the, the great test of, ahead of them of the great disappointment. And that blessed time um, followed uh, the, the, the spreading of that message in the 1840s around the world. And uh, in that time period, once the, the, the blessed time arrived, the message went forth with power under the midnight cry and ultimately, um, the world was divided into the two groups at the closing of the door. And brothers and sisters, that's, that's a fair history, a uh, fair way to uh, articulate an overview of that 1840 to 44 history uh, that took place, that in several places in inspiration, we've been told that it will be fulfilled to the, to the very letter, and particularly... <laughs> when we see what Sister White says about Revelation 10 when she says the seven thunders represent um, a delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angel's message. She says those seven thunders represent that, but she, in the same passage she also says the seven thunders relate to future events that will be fulfilled in their order. So when you look at that and you go back into Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, you see that identical sequence set up. This is what I learned here is in, in Daniel um, 11, uh, verse 40, the, the power is once again brought into earth's history with the collapse of a great empire just 
like uh, 1840, only this time it's the Soviet Union. The next verse identifies the issue in the United States, same sequence, it arrives in the United States. After that, verse 42, it goes to the world, same sequence. Verse 43 uh, portrays the papacy taking control, which um, gives you the, the counter position to the fact that the Lord has brought his people to the place where they're sealed and he's sealing his um, group of people right at that time. And then we see the, the, the loud cry message paralleling the same sequence as 1840 with the midnight cry. And it, it comes to the time where the world is divided into two classes. Brothers and sisters, that history is repeated to the very letter and that history is prefigured in the very verses, Daniel 11, 40 to 45, that is the message for this hour. That's what one of the, one of the things that I learned this week. I, I can actually understand and share that now, although not perfectly yet. I see it is truth, and I'm excited about that, among other things. I hope and trust that you've learned some things here as well, but I know that when we're dumping in information, information all day long for seven days, even if you see it go by and you know it's truth, there's no way that you can grasp onto it. So I would encourage you, most of you signed up for uh, this DVDs and videos, that when you get them, actually follow through and go through it one more time and see if there isn't a few things that we need to run over in our minds again. But finishing up to the prophetic pattern and this prophecy school. We spoke about a pattern last night. I personally ran out of steam so I did it the easy way, just off the top of my head. Usually after we set forth the pattern, which we did do on the PowerPoint last night, then we go back in and we try to confirm it with the testimony of two or three. And that's what we're going to do here at the beginning today. Um, once again, I did not hit the time clock. Um, I probably ought to do that. So... Prophets and Kings, page 714. Today the church of God is free to carry forward the, to completion the divine plan for the salvation of a lost race. Dropping down to the last sentence, she's put it in context for today. She's speaking about our time. And now she's going to compare it with history once again. God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of exile. Darkness precedes the first angel's message when it is portrayed um, in, in biblical history. And when I, what I say by when it's portrayed, um, all these characteristics that we're looking at, darkness preceding a reform message, followed by a revival message, followed by a judgment message, followed by a disappointment, followed by a work assigned to God's people, followed by a backslidden condition, followed by a repeat of the second message. This fourth angel's message, one way to represent it is the second angel's message. Prophetically, it's the same as the second angel's message. And we want to put that up there. We have a reason for putting a number two up there. That's the sequence that we've set up for us to see if it is repeated. Now, this is from uh, Prophets and Kings 554. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you in causing you to return to this place. We're looking at this history, by the way, down here, the beginning of the 2300 days, to see if, if the, the characteristics of this pattern are here as well as in the 1840 time period. And there was darkness down here was our first quote. And here we're looking at the next characteristic speaking of the three decrees, and uh, let's go to the next page. Still burdened in behalf of Israel, Daniel studied anew the prophecies of Jeremiah. They were very plain, so plain that he understood these testimonies recorded in books, the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem with faith, founded on the sure word of prophecy. Is Daniel a symbol of God's people at the end of the world? Yes. And where was his faith founded? On the sure word of prophecy. Daniel pleaded with the Lord for the speedy fulfillment of these promises. He pleaded for the honor of God to be preserved. 
In his petition, he identified himself fully with those who had fallen short of the divine purpose, confessing their sins as his own. I set my face unto the Lord, the, the prophet declared, to seek by prayer and supplications and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, made my confession. It's time for the children of Israel to come out of Babylon. Great controversy because of the darkness. Great controversy 326. In the seventh chapter of Ezra, the decree is found. In its completest form, it was issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, 457 B.C. But in Ezra 6.14, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem is said to have been built according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. These three kings, in originating, reaffirming, and completing the decree, brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy. There was, there was something required by the prophecy that required three kings to produce three decrees to make this prophecy perfect. And I'd submit to you that part of the perfection of it is that the Lord intended that this pattern be established at the very beginning of the 2300-day prophecy and in the middle and at the end and throughout um, biblical history. Um, God wants us to understand um, this pattern uh, because this is the pattern, the banner of the three angels' message that allows the ancient truths of prophecy to be recognized. These three kings, in originating, reaffirming, and completing the decree, brought it to the perfection required by the prophecy to mark the beginning of the 2300 days. Three decrees. Now notice, I was mentioning this last night, of the three decrees... They're all about bringing the children out of Babylon, all three of them, the children of Israel out of Babylon. But there's only one of the decrees in the Bible or in the spirit of prophecy that actually uses the terminology out of Babylon, and it's the second decree. And of course, the second decree is prefiguring what? The second angel's message, and the second angel's message is come out of Babylon. Prophets and Kings, 598. A score more years passed by when a second decree, quite as favorable as the first, was issued, also inspired Zechariah to plead with the exiles to return. Notice, we mentioned in the class many times when it comes to the second and fourth angel's message, what do we see in Scripture? A, a word that is repeated twice. And here's what Zechariah said. Ho, ho. Come forth and flee from the land of the north was the message given the scattered tribes of Israel. Dropping to the bold face in the middle, middle, deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. It's the second angel's message. One of the characteristics in the story of the three decrees is the second decree has with it the message, come out of Babylon. The third decree... Um, as we said last night, although these decrees are kind of uh, very, you know, they're like the Noah and his three sons, there's not a great deal of information there with them, uh, but the third decree starts the 2300-year prophecy, which is the prophecy of the judgment. So the fact that the third decree is the starting point for the judgment prophecy allows you to say that the third decree um, is a judgment message. It has, it has a truth connected to it that, that helps identify that particular way, Mark. I came to understand that um, from Brother Robert in Malaysia a couple years back. Prophets and Kings, page 612. Ezra had expected that a large number would return to Jerusalem, but the number who responded to the call was disappointingly small. After the third decree, Ezra's disappointed with how many people come out of Babylon. The third decree brings the judgment prophecy. I should have reversed those evidently. This one I should have had before it, but there it is. Um, the spiritual restoration of which the work carried forward in Nehemiah's day was a symbol is outlined in the words of Isaiah. You will find you will find this passage from Isaiah. They shall build up the old waste places and they shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities. You'll see this passage in Isaiah. Sister White will pick parts of it to describe the work that takes place in, the, in here and here with the Christian church 
And over here with us, she takes that same passage, same work. God's people are given a work after the third decree. But evils creep in. Southern Watchman, January 3rd, 1905. Solemnly and publicly the people of Judah had pledged themselves to obey the law of God, but when the influence of Ezra and Nehemiah was for a time withdrawn, there were many who departed from the Lord. Nehemiah had returned to Persia. During his absence from Jerusalem, evils crept in that threatened to pervert the nation. Now, you can articulate this any way you want. And when I was writing this up, I'm calling it evil. We've been calling it backsliding here. Uh, you could call it the Laodicean condition. This uh, reformation was not permanent. Nehemiah himself, returning from an extended visit to Persian court, found a sad state of affairs. With characteristic zeal, he sought to purify the church from its wickedness. Remember, Nehemiah is a symbol of the fourth angel's message, and the fourth and second angel's message uh, purified, they cleanse, they separate. A fourth decree. Prophets and Kings, 633. His request to the king had been so favorably received that Nehemiah was encouraged to ask for still further assistance to give dignity and authority to his mission as well as to provide protection on the journey he asked for and secured a military escort. He obtained royal letters to the governors of the provinces beyond the Euphrates. Fourth decree. All four of them are decrees. That's what allows us to say that this is the pattern. We had three decrees, we have a, a break in the flow of the history, and then a fourth decree. If, uh, if this was a message, and this was a decree, and this was a man, and uh, this was uh, you know, something else, you couldn't use it. But they're all the same entity, just like uh, uh, Balaam's three messages were messages, and his fourth message was a message, or cursings, or blessings. That's the testimony of two. Uh, the cleansing aspect of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah learned of this bold profanation, he promptly exercised his authority to expel the intruder. It grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. And we've looked at this earlier when we were dealing with uh, the three enemies we were looking at the same story, only from the perspective of who the enemies were, Tobiah, Geshem the Arabian, and Sanballat. But we've already looked at these quotes about how Nehemiah um, did a cleansing process here. The, Nehemiah is a symbol of the fourth decree, the fourth angel's message. There will be a cleansing and a purification that takes place when the latter rain arrives and the fourth angel joins the third at the Sunday Law in the United States. Let's, that's the testimony of the second history, we've looked at it in 1844, or down there, or up here. This, that's the testimony of two. We'll look at it in the days of Christ. Christ. Fundamentals of Christian education. Before the days of Christ, men ask in vain, what is truth? Darkness covered the earth, and gross darkness the people. There's darkness before the days of Christ. <clears throat> The Great Controversy, 351. And we've read this, um, but we'll read it again. The experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. As the disciples went out preaching, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, so Miller and his associates proclaimed that the longest and last prophetic period... No, no, you know... When you start looking what, what we're to understand about time no longer in Revelation 10, and there's so many of us in Adventism that's still trying to figure out how to come up with uh, some kind of prophetic time at the end of the world, but if you look closely, she says it over and over again in a variety of ways. Brother and sister, prophetic time is over in 1844. And, and she's saying it here, although she's not directly addressing that subject. So Miller and his associates proclaimed that the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible was about to expire, that the judgment was at hand and the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. The preaching of the disciples in regard to time was based on the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by Miller and his associates announced the termination of the 2300 days of Daniel 8.14, of which the 70 weeks form a, a part. The preaching of each was based upon the fulfillment of a different portion of the same prophetic period. That's what I was trying to emphasize here, is that 
All of these have their connection to the book of Daniel. And if you followed Russell this week, and I'm sure you did, not only do these, these revival time periods all the way down through history um, from the church of Ephesus to the end have a connection with the book of Daniel, there is one other thing that, that runs through that. Did you catch what it was? What's the other thing that he was mentioning um, that all the way through was there? Ah, three one comment. He wasn't mentioning that though. He was pointing out that in each of these important epics, Gabriel was there. Gabriel was there. Gabriel is the, the one that has directed this from beginning to end. Isn't that what you were saying? Gabriel was there all the way through. Uh, so Gabriel is going to be here in this time period, working, I believe, very hard to make uh, this mighty manifestation of the power of God go forward. Uh, the midnight cry, um, and uh, we're down here, we're down here. Um, John the Baptist, we looked at that already when we did 1844. John the Baptist was a type of William Miller, or William Miller was a type of John the Baptist. He brought the first angel's message. We're now looking at the second angel's message. Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 250-51. The midnight cry was not so much carried by argument, Though the scripture proof was clear and conclusive, there went with it an impelling power that moved the soul. There was no doubt, no questioning. Upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast flocked to the Mount of Olives. And as they joined the throng that were escorting Jesus, they caught the inspiration of the hour and helped swell the shout. Is the, the loud cry going to swell? And is the loud cry a shout? These are, these are words, a midnight cry, loud cry that pervades Scripture. But speaking of the triumphal entry, um, they help swell the shout, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. In like manner did unbelievers who flocked to the Adventist meeting, some from curiosity, some merely to ridicule, feel the convincing power attending the message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Sister White um, is tying the midnight cry time period, which is definitely part of the second angel's message. What did the midnight cry join? It joins the second angel's message. They join together. She ties the, the, the midnight cry time period with the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And, and there she ties it to other biblical histories as well, but we're just trying to con confirm this pattern upon the testimony of two or three. Notice where Christ was going um, on the cross. Great controversy, 405. 500 years before, the Lord had declared by the prophet Zechariah, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. And the reason I'm emphasizing these things is because inspiration has a way of trying to let us know this is a history that deals with the midnight cry or the loud cry. And uh, the shout, the cry out, these are techniques that inspiration is using to try to let us see what these histories are pointing forward to. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Uh, in Bible prophecy, I don't know that I've said this here, but a daughter in Bible prophecy, what? It's end time. It's the, it's the last generation. Um, just like uh, ancient is history, modern, end time. A daughter. This is a, the daughter of Zion, the remnant of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Had the disciples realized that Christ was going to judgment and to death, they could have not fulfilled his prophecy. The cross is a judgment, a number three message. In like manner, Miller and his associates fulfilled prophecy and gave a message which inspiration had foretold should be given to the world but which they could not have given had they fully understood the prophecies pointing out their disappointment and presenting another message to be preached to all nations before the Lord should come. The first and second angel's message were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God designed to accomplish by them. We're familiar with this after the cross, the disappointment. And uh, you'll notice in the second paragraph, um, Yet God accomplished his own beneficent purpose 
and permitting the warning of judgment to be given just as it was. The great day was at hand, and in his providence the people were brought to the test of definite time. There was a testing process in the Millerite movement, and the test was uh, developed around time. We are going through a testing process here at the end, but time is no more. It's going to be the same purification process, but the element of time um, is not in this um, in, in connection with time prophecy. Brought, brought to the test of a definite time in order to reveal to them what was in their hearts. Um, that's what this process is about, to re reveal to us what is in our hearts that we might allow uh, the Holy Spirit with our cooperation to remove it from our hearts so we can reflect the character of Christ. The message was designed for the testing and purification of the church. The message of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is designed for the testing and purification of the church. Uh, brothers and sisters, if you have opportunity to begin sharing this message, um, you're going to see that it's a testing message. You're going to see people rise up against it um, in a variety of ways. The disappointment also, though the result of their own misapprehension of the message which they gave was to be overruled for good. It would test the hearts. That's where we're at today. Uh, the difference is the Millerites were Philadelphians. They were on fire for the word of God, and they did not know that they were in a testing time. We are Laodiceans. We don't really want to do anything with the word of God, but we've been forewarned that we are in a testing time. Then they were giving a work. Um, the desire of ages, the Christian church back here I'm speaking of. We're still back here. We've seen the darkness before Christ, John the Baptist, the reform message, uh, the second angel's message illustrated by the triumphal entry, entry, the judgment at the cross, the disappointment of the disciples immediately after the cross, and then the work that's given to the Christian church. We'll start where it's bold face in the middle of the paragraph. Men reared up the Jewish tabernacle. Now notice what she's doing. She's going back to this history. Uh, men built the Jewish temple, but the sanctuary above, of which the earthly was a type, was built by no human architect. And, and, and you could say she's going back to when Solomon raised up the temple, but it's just another history of the work that God's people were given. Uh, that's what they were brought out of Egypt to do, was to rebuild um, the to build the earthly sanctuary. And David sets forth an example through his son Solomon of that same history, and then this same history is repeated when they come out of Babylon, and the same history is repeated um, in the time of Christ, and all of these histories are point for, pointing forward to the work that Adventism did, was to do when we build the spiritual temple of which we are all living stones in that temple. Um, the fourth message which is simple, it's an easy one to see. What's the fourth message? Pentecost, um, in that time period. Um, let me see if I got these out of sync. I, I didn't put it in, probably. Maybe it's in here. Review and Herald, January 20th, 1891. Would it not be well for the members of the churches to devote some time to earnest prayer and to study the words of Christ concerning the Comforter? Christ sent the Comforter upon his disciples when they were earnestly praying for it, and were as one in their desires and petitions. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Now normally I put in here, and I don't have it in here obviously, um, that before Pentecost came, the disciples had to put away their differences with one another. I know it's, a, it's not a real strong illustration of a backslidden condition, but nevertheless, it is part of the testimony, and as a waymark, it stands firm, um, because it, it's not so much trying to teach that the disciples were Laodiceans as it is it's trying to make sure that the waymarks in this pattern are firm, and they are, and then Pentecost is the fourth message. Now, what I want you to look at here um, is that all this pattern Everywhere it's at, even in our day and age, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? It's to convince the world of sin. That's a reform message. And of righteousness. When revival comes, righteousness is demonstrated 
and of what else? Judgment to come. That's the three steps of the Holy Spirit. This pattern is established upon the work of the Holy Spirit. It's founded upon the, the Holy Spirit. Sin, righteousness, judgment. The three steps of the Holy Spirit are what this prophetic pattern is developed on. Review and Herald, April 25th, 1893. Concerning the advent of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I, do, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now read carefully, that you may discern what is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, that's a reform message, and righteousness, when you're alive, you have the righteousness of Christ and of judgment, of sin because they believed on me, and on. It is, it is essential that we who are fallen through sin shall put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, which has been prepared for us. The Holy Spirit was to convince the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Amen. That's three testimonies on that pattern. Um, You can go a long way with Zechariah. In Zechariah 4, 6 through 4, we'll show you at least one thing, but we can't spend a great deal of time there. Uh, Zechariah 4, verses 6 through 9. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings, crying. Those are words in the Bible that are talking about the second and fourth angel's message, the midnight cry, the loud cry. And then notice this repetition. What are they going to shout? What are they going to cry? Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands will also finish it, that thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And what I'm saying to you is in the story of Zerubbabel, the foundation of Adventism was established in the second angel's message time period. This is why the 1843 time period is illustrating um, the, this, this, the climax of the sealing process of the 1840 to 44 14, time period. This outpouring of the Spirit in the beginning of Adventism was a sealing that took place. This is the foundation of Adventism that is symbolized by Zerubbabel. Now, what does Zerubbabel mean? You see it on the screen. Um, a descendant of Babylon. It means out of Babylon. That's his name. And it's saying that Zerubbabel is a type of the foundation of Adventism, the outpouring of the Spirit at the beginning, he's also the capstone because the second and fourth angel's message are the same message and Zerubbabel is symbolizing those two messages and it's the foundation of Adventism was established in the 1840 to 44 time period but the outpouring of the Spirit was in the midnight cry, the headstone of God's final remnant church is when the Holy Spirit is poured out in the latter rain in the fourth angel's message. There's a whole lot more to say to that. But it's, he, it, he's symbolizing a sealing. Notice this of Zerubbabel in Haggai 2. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Je Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of kingdoms of the heathen and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, and I'm suggesting to you, he's a symbol of out of Babylon, second and fourth angel's message. I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord, and I will make thee as a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. What's a signet? It's a seal particularly in Great Britain, the seal used by a king in sealing his private letters and grants that pass by bill under his majesty's hands. So what I'm saying to you is when it comes to the second and fourth angels' message, which are the same messages, Zerubbabel is a type of the foundation 
and the capstone of Adventism, and he's also representing a seal. There was a sealing that took place in the beginning of Adventism, and the sealing that takes place in the end of Adventism is underway. And Zerubbabel symbolizes both those messages. Shaking time. Testimonies, volume 5, page 214. says, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. This is the, the experience um, that is uh, brought into the history of 1840 to 44. It's the experience uh, that we are in currently. Now, the reason that I put a two in front of here when I have opportunity to teach this message, I teach it just like I've done in a step-by-step -step process. You, if you haven't looked at this material before and you haven't looked ahead in your notes, um, you'll see that I've set this pattern, the pattern darkness, reform message, revival with the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, judgment followed by disappointment, followed by a work, followed by backsliding, followed by a repeat of the second angel's message. And I try to get that firm in everyone's mind because now here comes the next step, which is a little bit tricky sometimes. And it's this. It's, it's, you can logic it through if you logic it through with me. The second angel's message and the fourth angel's message are the same message out of Babylon, right? So in that sense, the fourth angel's message can be called a number two message, right? That's, that's not stretching the logic too far, right? Now here's where I stretch the logic. I, I haven't learned how to articulate this where, where I don't cause a little bit of confusion here, so, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. If this is a number two message, then what has to come before it? A number one. And if it's a number two message, what has to come after it? A number three. Now, see, this is why I don't put it all out there at the beginning because it just, I've watched people, I've lost people at this point many times. But a reform message must precede the fourth angel's message. Manuscript releases, volume 5, page 94. Would it not be well for you to seek the Lord at, as the disciples sought him before the day of Pentecost? Maybe that's why I didn't put it in. This is a, 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 a nailing down that way mark of a need of reformation before Pentecost by the disciples. After Christ's ascensions, his disciple, men of varied talents and capabilities, assembled in the upper chamber to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In this room, all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. They made thorough work of repentance by confessing their own sins. Upon them was laid no burden to confess one another's sins, Settling all differences and alienations, they were of one accord and prayed with unity of purpose for ten days, and at the end of which time they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Before a fourth message, there will have to be a reform message. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. This is where we are. We're waiting for the fourth angel's message, but before we can have that message, brothers and sisters, we got to allow the Holy Spirit to bring us out of the Laodicean condition. We need to have, allow the Holy Spirit to convict us that we are Laodiceans because Sister White, when speaking of the Laodicean condition, she says no greater deception, no greater deception can come up on a human mind than to think that everything is all right when everything is is all wrong. That's where we're at as Laodiceans as we stand on this side of the latter rain. And we need to shake off that condition. We need a message of reform to awaken us to this truth. The spirit of true reform will be met in our days as in ancient times. Those who are zealous for the honor of God and who will not countenance sin either in ministers or people need not expect rest or pleasure in this life. Untiring vigilance must be the watchword of all who guard the interests of Christ's church. During Nehemiah's absence from Jerusalem, 
Evils were introduced which threatened to pervert the nation. The same danger exists in our time. Notice where she goes to illustrate uh, the Laodicean condition down here just prior to the latter reign. Where does she go? She goes to the time period before Pentecost. She goes to the time period before Nehemiah. These histories are what illustrate the end of the world. This is the banner of the third angel's message that opens up uh, the ancient truths of Bible prophecy. Um, fourth message followed by judgment. Test, Prophets and Kings 699. After a fourth message, because it's a second message, we should expect to see judgment. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you something here. I think I'm running out of time to really nail all this down, but it's available on the prophetic pattern study. When you begin to look at the truth that a fourth angel's message in these histories are preceded by a reform message, a number one message, and then followed by a judgment message, you'll find something very interesting when it's illustrated. Uh, you know, every prophetic line doesn't always identify all the way marks. Some of them, like Noah and his three sons, is very simple. But when the prophetic lines that are dealing with this pattern give you much information, one of the things that you will find, and um, it, it's interesting in my mind, is this. The first judgment message, the original judgment message, is a judgment against mankind at large in general. Okay, but the number three message that follows the fourth message, it's always a judgment on God's people. There's a distinction in, in the pattern that's illustrated every time. Um, for instance, the judgment um, at the cross was a judgment for all mankind. But the judgment that followed Pentecost was a judgment that took place within the church. Okay? The judgment um, at Passover in Egypt was a judgment on Egypt, symbolizing all, and man, all mankind. But after uh, Moses receives the law and the earth opens up and swallows those that were dancing around the golden calf, that was a judgment on the church. And you'll see that that's reflected. Uh, every time you follow what I'm saying, there's a distinction between the, the first judgment message and the second judgment message in the pattern. And I know, I forewarned you, this is the part <laughs> where I can lose you, but nevertheless, it is illustrated and we got it on the record. The one week, seven years, ended in AD 34. Then by the stoning of Stephen, the Jews finally sealed their rejection of the gospel. The disciples who were scattered abroad by persecution went everywhere preaching the word and shortly after, Saul the persecutor was converted and became Paul the Apostle. Some I saw would, would gladly return. Others will not let this message to the Laodicean church have its weight upon them, and they will glide along much after the same manner as before and will be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Those only who zealously will repent will have favor with God. Now what I'm saying to you, in the 18, this is the 1844 um, period up here. It is down there too, but this is in a bigger way. The judgment that began in 1844 was the judgment for all mankind. But as we approach the loud cry time period, number one, we're, we've been given a work to do to rebuild spiritual Jerusalem. Uh, but brothers and sisters, if you look around in Adventism today, we're in a backslidden condition. We're in the Laodicean condition. And there has to be a reform message that comes that awakens the Laodiceans to their need and um, if they prepare, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out upon them. Um, but for those that don't prepare, the door is closed. Now, certainly, it's a very close, uh, these waymarks are very close down here at the end. But the closing of the door in this revival time period, it's not on the world at large. It's on the virgins of Adventism. The second judgment deals with God's church. The first judgment deals with the world at large in these patterns. 
in Nehemiah's time, on returning from Persia down here, Nehemiah symbolizes the fourth angel's message. Nehemiah learned of the bold profanation and took prompt measures to expel the intruder. He was dealing with casting Tobiah out of the sanctuary, sending those uh, men that would refuse to turn loose of their heathen wife, sending them out of Israel to walk no more with them forever. He was dealing with a judgment um, of Israel. Got it? Okay, and in, in the time period of Christ, this will be a quick one for us. All I want to say here is that in the history of Christ, in the patterns that have been illustrated in the Bible, in the time period that Christ was here, um, you'll find the most complete pattern, other than, of course, Adventism. And we've already went through this. We have this uh, darkness before John the Baptist, who is a, a, a reform message that was followed by a second message and the triumphal entry, followed by the judgment that took place at the cross, the disappointment that followed after the work that was given to the Christian church, the backslidden condition symbolized by the disciples having to put away their sins before Pentecost, which was the, um, the fourth angel's message, and then the judgment upon the church. And I've, I'm not threatened if you use AD 34 to the stoning of Stephen to symbolize that judgment, or... Um, you could also use the story of Ananias and Sapphira. But nevertheless, this pattern in the time period of Christ continues, and we've already looked at it. In AD 70, after all this, um, the destruction of Jerusalem symbolizes the seven last plagues. And then we've already looked at um, AD 100. What happened in AD 100? The second coming of Christ, as symbolized by Christ coming to the Isle of Patmos and bringing the revelation to John. And we, here's the quote on the screen um, identifying the, the seven last plague time period with the destruction of Jerusalem. And here's the one on the second coming of Christ. We've already went over these previously. The line of Moses we talked about last night. Um, here's the darkness uh, that preceded Moses. Um, and he brings a reform message upon the Sabbath. That's the number one message. The number two is... The pouring out of the plagues in Egypt. The number three, the judgment of the firstborn on the Passover. Followed by the disappointment at the Red Sea, paralleling the disappointment in 1844. Uh, there's the disappointment. The number four, the receiving of the law on Mount Sinai, which is where we get the history that we call Pentecost which points forward to the latter rain. Um, the evils. I'm just registering these on the video. We've already went over these. The work of Moses. The reform. I've wanted to have a prophecy school in the United States for a long time. We've had it a, a lot of places around the world, and we have a lot of this material uh, translated in, in other countries. Um, but it's a blessing to think that we finally have this prophecy school from beginning to end in English. And I want to thank you all for participating. Um, I hope that you've received the blessing uh, that I've received. And I think we have. I, I haven't heard... I haven't heard any negative comments, uh, and, and I'm saying that from the point of view that usually when we have opportunity to go out and share Bible prophecy, you can almost be assured you're going to get some negative comments. Uh, and I expected this when, it, when we invited um, friends here that it was going to be like this, and it's been a joy. Um, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, you would bring the history of Zerubbabel into our midst and make this time we've spent here a sealing process. We want to be among those that um, partake of this mighty manifestation of the power of God at this time in their history and be among those that carry this final warning message to the world, this message of your character, of your glory that the world needs to see in order to make an intelligent decision 
about the test that's about to be brought upon all mankind. But Lord, you teach in your prophetic word that at this time in earth's history, um, we're in need of setting aside idols, habits um, that in our lives that are preventing the Holy Spirit to cooperate with us. We ask that you do whatever it takes in each and one of, it, of our experiences to reveal those areas that we need to surrender to you and then give us the courage and the willingness to enter into that process. We're heading home now and uh, we're going hundreds of miles away and thousands of miles away. Some of us get home today. Some of us don't get home for a few days. We ask that you would bless us with traveling mercies, that we all can um, be home safely with our families, continue to watch over our families that aren't present, and prepare the way in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, um, that the doors will be open to where we can share this light uh, that we've partaken of here with those that you know are ready to receive it. Prepare the way before us, Lord. And we thank you for this time, this week, uh, in every possible way uh, for the blessings we've received. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.